So I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey and show you some parts of my career that are important to how I arrived at this point in my artwork, including my influences, where I am at now, and where I'm going next. This is a close-up of Bastion that's in Eno right now. This piece is Winter's Wind. Normally, I would explain the passage of time to all of you, but with the whole COVID-19 situation, I think we all get it. I believe we are more aware than ever that everything in our life is passing. I live in the North where I'm constantly reminded of our transients. Embracing that has allowed to examine it, has allowed me to examine it through my work. An amazing friend and mentor of mine likes to say, our work is a reflection of self. That thought scares me. I live surrounded by nature, relatively untouched by humans. The rocks, trees, trees and lakes around me are a daily reminder that I am only passing through. Those trees were here long before me and will be here long after. I strive to reflect their graceful strength in my work. Through this work, I contemplate the passage of time, genetic memory, and the evanescence of life. At the same time, I am aware of what can't be seen. This image is a, a tailings pond from my local gold mine. I drive past the lake and the pond regularly, and I'm aware of the influence on both on my work. So back to my inspiration. My feeling of transience is partially due to where I live. For those of you who don't know, I live a short 22-hour drive from Bloomfield, very near the Ontario-Manitoba border, two and a half hours north of the Trans-Canada Highway. To go further north, you must fly. I am also grateful for this virtual world that is being created. I have never before been able to connect or explore other artists' work on this level. I'm soaking up every moment that I can. I've lived in Northwestern Ontario for most of my life. Although I have lived many other places in Canada, for me, this is home. And the impressions of rocks, lakes, and snow have been inscribed on my soul. I am inspired at every turn by my surroundings. For example, the granite rock that led to the Craig and the Outcrop series. This piece called Granite Craig is up for auction on the Eno site. And this is one of the Outcrop series. Geared Clack Aeol is 30 inches long and in, was inspired by the rock along the road around Kingston. Intensity is another iteration of the Kingston landscape. The wilderness was my childhood sanctuary, always an escape and an adventure. This piece forest reflects that wilderness. It's about the tiniest wild, wildflowers living their quiet and solitary life. And it's about the even more secret lives no one ever sees, hidden under decaying logs, creating wonder and mystery. Like in this small piece magma, it's inspired by those forest wonders we find hidden. This was one of my first pieces in this style, and it was selected for a show at the Ball Museum of Glass in Muncie, Indiana, by the artist Catherine Gray. She is an amazing glass artist and host of the Netflix show, Blown Away. This is the complete view of that piece. This piece orb was made at about the same time and was inspired by a prickly seed pod from a tree I found in Portland. Ancient Brock is a continuation on this series. They, these are all small, around five inches in diameter. A close up of one called Autumn's Brock. My inspiration also comes from being on the water and seeing the richness that surrounds me. All of this nurtures my creative process. Looking at the way water moves is always a joy, a study in pattern. I replicated that joy through these pieces. You can still see the layering and the textural detail. This series is called Fame, Gaelic for Ripples. This was in SOFA, the Sculptural Objects Functional Art and Design Fair in Chicago. I love how people imagine my work and rearrange it in their space. The good part of living in Red Lake is its beauty and seclusion. 
The difficult part of living here is the isolation. This piece is called growing, and you can see again the influence. This piece is called Bent But Not Broken, following the same theme, but the title and movement is inspired by Irma, a 2017 hurricane that hit the Florida Keys. The ice roads that we travel on in the winter make for great stories and inspiration in glass. For pieces such as Winter's Ice. You can see how this piece progresses from my work with larger cubes to form ice ridge. This one is about 15 inches long. I can't deny it's often frustrating and challenging to be in a small community. The benefits of isolation are substantial for me as an artist. The quiet ease of being truly alone, spending time in solitude, being forced to be with myself is deeply valuable. It's helped me seek out connections from around the world, and I've made friends that are amazing. This piece is called Exploration, and again reveals the layers. Another profound influence on me is that I was always involved in aviation. I became a pilot at the age of 21. I love to fly and still marvel today at the possibilities of flight and the magnificent inventions we as humans have created. The, I am aware at the same time that these inventions are a contradiction. These beautiful little spheres, worthy of any artist, are part of a guided missile system. I've always painted. This is one of my early efforts. Here's another. A recent teacher put my painting ability in perspective when he told me that the good news was I had unlimited potential for improvement. I continue to explore painting and drawing as I believe it helps me be more observant and critical in my sculpture. After painting, I was lucky enough to begin in clay. You see the sphere influences. Fortunately, there was a lady in Red Lake who gave pottery classes. I think all artists' lives are a unique combination of design and accident. Mine certainly was. Clay led me to being included in my first art show in Kenora, but I was never completely happy working in clay, so I discovered glass. I began by simply slumping any glass I could find, making things like plates and dishes. This is an early casting of a lane, which was almost 30 inches long, that my son found on a beach. I coated it in smooth on silicone, and my husband always had the fun job of uncoating these after they had sat outside in the sun for 24 hours. I did birds, fish, and snakes. My freezer is still a place of terror for small children. This is another early casting, one of my favorites, Gentleman's Agreement. It's the beginning of narrative work for me. During my long apprenticeship, my children were the subjects of many learning experiments. They always threatened me with calling child and family services. Here, for example, I forgot to use the mold release, and the mold stuck to the hair on his arms and legs, but I persevered. My body costumes landed me my first show at Definitely Superior Artist Run Center in Thunder Bay. Glass stimulates both my technical and creative sides. This is the back of my son that you just saw with some cast goose wings attached. Another body casting called Working. Glass has held my attention. It's challenging and has endless artistic possibilities. This is an architectural installation in Dryden in 2006, I believe. Each of these pods is clay at about two and a half feet high. I had three months to get this job done. So that meant loading and unloading the kiln 24 hours a day. But working that intensely helped me build skill and confidence. In 2009, I was given this job at our local heritage center. This is a donor wall that is completely made out of hand-painted ceramic tiles. It's 11 by 21 feet. This is Carnival Restaurant in Winnipeg. Over 200 pieces of this beautiful glass were suspended. But during this time, I never stopped exploring landscape, time, and layering. The passage of time is constant, like my layers and my work. These two young men, my sons, have manifested for me the passage of time. You really get a sense of time watching children grow at what seems like lightning speed, sharing the traditions of family and stories of ancestors with them. 
helping them prepare for their future. It really makes you aware that you're such a small part of history. Glass is the perfect medium to explore this thought of passage of time as its own rich traditions have been passed down through the generations. And it takes a great deal of time to master its fragility and strength. I'm fortunate to have participated in several amazing learning opportunities. My first was a glass mentorship through Fusion with the amazing Kuhn Bender student, head of glass at Sheridan, to whom I am extremely and forever grateful. The mentorship lasted well over a year, and this piece is the result of that time and Kuhn's constant encouragement, which then led to the creation of this piece, which is like it which was a finalist with honorable mention in the 2014 Bullseye Glass International Competition, which led to an opportunity for me to attend a residency at Pilcha. This school was built by Dale Chihuly and his compatriots in Stanwood, Washington, at the foot of the Cascade Mountains, where I was able to explore color. The lichen piece that you saw before led to this Eric series. This is Dear Eric Nunes, Brief Eric, Badil Eric. As you can see from these photos, no two are ever the same. Glass resounds with insignificance, at one moment strong and vibrant, the next shattered and discarded. So another turning point was in 2014, where I was able to attend a glass residency with Professor Mark Ganter at University of Washington in order to explore direct 3D printing in glass or vitroglyphic printing, a process these guys pioneered. I needed to examine how the automated 3D printing process relates to my own manual process. Professor Ganter is the gentleman in the Hawaiian shirt. For this residency, I needed to learn Rhino. It was thought provoking for me to be able to create a glass object that my hands never touched. This caused me to take some time to contemplate the nature of my process. I simply designed the object to push print. I became aware, aware of how the act of physically making becomes an embedded part of both my vision and the emotional content of my work. I believe there is something invaluable in work made by hand. As a result of the RBC Award for Glass, I was able to attend a residency with 13 other artists in Norway. Most of our time was spent in Berlevec. By the side of the house are two reindeer. I just want to share this with you. This doesn't have anything to do with my glass, but we were north of the Arctic Circle. They thought it was cold here. The average day was minus 15, virtually balmy for Canada. The wind, however, was incredible. This photo was taken on the day we were leaving. They have gate arms that come down across the highway and close it with scheduled times of departure so that we could travel in a group behind a snowplow with, which led us on the three hour journey south. Really not a bad idea. It was beautiful and isolated, just like home. This residency again, furthered my work and shifted my perspective. I now look at where I live a little differently. I realize that all of the rich details of the landscape in Norway surround me in red light. I now make a conscious effort to take time to notice them. This series fig was partially born of vertical shale in Norway. Here's another one in that series. Truth and Consequence followed this. And another one of my favorites, Reading Between the Lines. This is also up for auction on the Eno site. The squares that you saw earlier evolved to this, Promises and Lies Keeping Score. The stacks of paper were reminiscent of those nails restaurants used to have. I don't know if you guys remember those. They used to be beside the till, and when you paid, they stuck your receipt on that nail. The receipts accumulated a tally of the day's sales just like the promises and lies. Obviously, a bit of realization period in my life, but it was a finalist in the 2016 International Emerge competition. Here's a close-up of some of the pieces. 
And then this is Promises in Life, keeping score next to Jeffrey Stenbaum's dog tags at the Bellevue Art Museum in Washington. Here's another Promises in Life, Everything Will Be Okay, at the Marietta Cobb Museum of Art in Atlanta. This piece was at a time when I was gutted with my son going to school and a shift in world politics. And Promises and Lies Rubicon, if any of you are familiar with the gold world, you'll understand. A close-up of Rubicon. Promises and Lies keeping score led me to another residency. In 2016, exploring the Scottish landscape in Leicester, Scotland, sorry, where I was able to search for my ancestors and explore memory. So before I left for Scotland, my husband bought me a brief ancestry inquiry into my great grandmother's side of the family. I read it before I left, but I did not realize exactly where all the towns were until I was driving through them. Yes, my geography sucks. Many people ask why I do the work I do. I have all kinds of answers, all of which I believe. I knew my family was from near Leicester, Northland's Glass Studio. For those of you familiar with the area, they lived in Thurso and Lather and Wales, as well as many other places in Scotland. With the help, I found where my great-grandmother lived, only 15 minutes from the studio where I was working, and discovered rock formations I've never seen before, which looks surprisingly like my work. I've always wondered where my work comes from, and this residency connected me to my artistic DNA. This trip didn't answer all my questions, but it feels like it's brought me full circle. From realizing where my design aesthetic originated and watching how a society continues to pour stories and traditions into living memory, like the layering of my work, we're always in the midst of passage of time. I'm grateful that the Ontario Arts Council and the Chalmers Family Fund have awarded me a Chalmers Fellowship to continue to explore this relationship. And continuing this research, although right now I'm supposed to be in Scotland, I'm waiting for the world to change so I can go back to Scotland and finish my fellowship. Four years ago, I was asked by the Thunder Bay Art Gallery to do a show, and they generously set no restrictions on me. I wanted to make an installation which has allowed me to explore this area north of Red Lake. It's always been fascinating to me. It's a moraine left during the last ice age. I can never resist holding and touching these rocks. I believe a rock has memory and it holds energy. And I love it when people want to tentatively, gently touch my artwork. So I wanted to combine that experience somehow. So I created what I feel represents that area and again follows the Brock series. This installation has 10,000 rocks and stones, all made by hand. It took two years to complete and it's called 21 Pillows. It's an interactive glass installation. Visitors get to come in, move rocks around as they please and manipulate the landscape. This installation has been to Ottawa and Sudbury, oh, and Thunder Bay, and then it'll travel to Kenora in the fall and Waterloo in the winter of 2021. Okay, now I need everybody to hold on. I'm gonna show you a picture of my studio, Nobody Saint. This is it. This is where I work. It's an old dance hall, all shiplap, hardwood floors. It was part of the Polish Alliance of Canada. I'm fortunate to rent out the top for retail space and I have the basement. It's 40 by 80 feet with 12 foot ceilings. I have three kilns which operate almost continuously. COVID-19 finds me slowly cleaning it after about 10 years of running from project to project. This is the glass storage part of the studio that was behind that metal wall. This is how I look when I work. It's very dusty. I normally wear a full respirator. So the whole mask thing, I am okay with. To create my sculptures, I pass grit, which is powdered glass, through screens, build up the sculptures layer by layer, much like a manual 3D printing process. This is how it looks as it comes out of the kiln. I put all the layers of loose powder in the kiln, 
and they're fired at a center. The center varies from kiln to kiln and sculpture to sculpture. I relinquish my work and hope that the kiln does its magic as anticipated. My largest kiln is six feet by 38 inches, so I'm working towards sculptures that large. I'm fortunate to live in a time where supplies are accessible. Here's my shelf of crit. Each jar is five pounds, so you have some idea of the size and volume. This is crushed glass in a whole world of color. I use colors as a painter would. I find all of these to have, add in bits, excites me, and enhances the layer. Although I'm often torn between my colored work and the design aesthetic of white, I've also become more aware of the impact of my art has on the environment. This has driven me to begin exploring recycled glass. This piece is Bastion, which Eno currently has, made from beautiful recycled glass with just a hint of aquamarine. This is an inside view of Bastion. Glacial is also a piece made with recycled glass, and it's related to my mirror series. This one is 17 inches long and about eight inches high, five inches wide, and weighs about 40 pounds. I also work in a group with two other artists, George Whitney and Jerry Davidson. We occasionally show work together, and we believe we are all similar in our perspective, but not in our work. George, who makes these big, beautiful, clear glass sculptures, uh, is experimenting with me, and we're seeing what happens when we include each other's work in our own. Our results are limited at this point, but fun and encouraging. Moving forward in my immediate future, a few pieces I'm working on I'd like to share. These are sketches of a project I have planned for this summer. So COVID-19 has had effect on my routine. I'm slower, more considerate of what I'm actually working on and how I'm doing it. It feels like some kind of strange time warp, but I'm kind of enjoying it. This piece is a bit of a new direction. Everything in my work is a stretch and a step that requires more learning. For each of those folds you saw, I make one of these layered glass rectangular ribbons, and then they get slumped or folded twice in the kiln. They'll all be fired together at the end to make the whole piece. This is another project destined for this summer. They've been several years in the making. And because it's a larger bowl shape than I've made to this point, I'm running tests in my kiln, which have so far have taken a month and they're not done yet. I'm trying to ensure that I find the optimum temperature that will reach the interior of the pieces, but not too hot to melt it into a solid blob at the bottom of my kiln. Someone once said, you need to make folded paper. I think that was about three years ago. So here's the physical exploration of that idea. Each piece, again, made individually and folded twice in the kiln. And using recycled glass, I love how these pieces seem to float on a current of air, gently gliding. This piece isn't complete yet, but almost. These are new bits. They're just small one-inch pieces of glass but I'm using them in my quest to build bigger and they allow me for more exploration. I'm also nearing the completion on a commission for the Thunder Bay Art Gallery called Mendabi. This is an image I took from the site of the new gallery, which will be printed on sheer organza and hung from the ceiling. My glass is incorporated as the, as the piers you see in front. This commission also had me going back to the torch which I have not used since I first began in glass many years ago, learning to blow bubbles. So that I can simulate the water between the piers for the Thunder Bay Commission. My recent COVID-19 fascination has been working with Cass Pewter, which is allowing me to explore the boreal forest in more detail. Here you can see the pewter in a mold mix of plaster and silica. And then once it's cleaned, we get these delightful records of the existence of small lichen. And some mushrooms that I've made. The largest mushroom here is about four or five inches. I'm enjoying these because the duration of the process is much shorter than what I normally do. 
and just look at the underside of that big mushroom. I'm sure this will make it into my glass work soon. And these are on my to-do list. Thanks so much for joining me today and allowing me to take you on a journey. I'll stop sharing my screen. There. Does anybody have any questions? Really, that was fascinating, mm -hmm. Carol. Thank you so very much. Yes. Little no, applause you. from all of us to you. That was really um, very fascinating. So what questions do people have? Feel free to ask them. Unmute yourself. And Jerry, go ahead. Unmute your mic, Jerry. Yep. Um, beautiful, Cheryl, uh, as always. And I'm fortunate enough to have one of your small pieces, which is treasured. Uh, looking back at promises and lies, everything will be okay. To me, it seems very relevant today. Do you have any plans to revisit that series? Um, do I, I don't think that series will ever stop, but it, it happens to be a pretty emotional series. Um, so... I think I need the right amount of emotion and the right amount of anger mixed in to actually do it again. So hopefully I will will revisit again, just hopefully not in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. <laughs> Looking at your process and as you were describing it, I noticed Heather Allen Hayatala uh, facial expressions as uh, she was watching the images of your kiln as you described various successes and failures. Heather, um, I'm wondering if you can unmute your mic over there for a minute. Are you able to do that? And I, I, I'd like to hear your reaction to some of the experimenting that Cheryl's been engaged in based on your own experience experimenting with clay. Mm -hmm. I found, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I found your talk just wonderful and really resonated with the way you worked with different materials and how they fed back and forth and how your, um, your, your, your visual landscape, your immediate landscape and your materials and your ideas were so integrated as a progression. Thank you. And I, my, I guess one question would be, glass is your primary focus, right? Yeah. Do you still do, like, where will this pewter and where will these other materials, will they be something on their own or will they just be inspiration for the glass? Uh, I don't know yet. Um, I know the pewter is good because my son took it all. So it's sitting on his coffee table. So, you know, it's chuck it with somebody. I'm right now, I'm just having fun with it. Um, and it really is inspiring. And I have, I have to just say, I grow mushrooms. I have mushroom logs. <laughs> and the detail in your mushrooms were amazing. Well, I actually take a mushroom and cast it in the plaster silica, and then I burn the mushroom out and pour the pewter in. So I'm getting the exact replica, which I'm thrilled with. But that comes from the glass casting knowledge, right? Right. right. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you for your comments. Well, one thing I really found interesting, Cheryl, I didn't know that you were a pilot. Uh, in a former life, and uh, it, did I hear you say correctly that you were the you were the pilot? I was the pilot. So, <clears throat> what really fascinated me was the way that you are constantly vacillating between macro and micro views, where you are getting uh, aerial views from the perspective of the plane, and then you're also getting these uh, very almost microscopic or very highly detailed images of a close-up of something. And somehow those two kinds of images become one and the same. And uh, I found the way you played with perspective really fascinating. Oh, thank you. Bu Hi, Bunny. Hi. I, I'm in awe of your work, Cheryl, from the first time I saw it at the gallery. And um, 
I'd like to know what your day is like. Uh, you said you're, you have three kilns and sometimes they're working 24 hours. I just, I tell me, tell me what your day is like, your art day. My art day. Well, my normal art day um, is I usually, I'm in a morning prison, so I usually try and be at my studio, which is only 20 minutes from my house. That's a 20 minute walk. It's a two minute drive. So, um, and I'm trying to walk because so I need the exercise, but anyway. So I try and be in my studio for eight and it, I stay there till two or three till I'm absolutely starving. Um, so I... I always have one kiln where I'm doing short projects. All of my sculptures you see that you see at Eno and stuff takes several days to fire. So I try and get the kilns going in some kind of rhythm uh, that I've always got a kiln that I can load the next day. Um, and if I can't fire, do that, if I've got two that are firing that are big, I try and keep the little ones so it'll fire every day. But I can also, while I'm waiting for things to fire, I build those sculptures. Those sculptures actually take me a long time to build. But I can have them built and sitting. I just can't move them or shuffle them or hit them until I get them into the kiln. So, so that's my day. And then I come home at 2 or 3, eat lunch, right, get dinner ready, and I spend the rest of the day on my computer doing the stuff that I should be doing, the marketing and the emails and all those other fun things. So that's kind of what my day is like. Does that help? Yes, it does. And you have several, it's like you're not multitasking. Well, you are multitasking. You've, yeah. got, you've got the images in your hands and then the practical timing and the creativity. It's, you know, I, 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 I do some projects and I, I just go so, scattered that I have to shut down. So I, well, I have my ability to do that. Well, I am finding actually this year that the laying out the drawings and having, I normally have a plan, but it's usually what strikes me. And this year I have a concrete, because I have concrete deadlines, the concrete drawings are laid out. And I'm finding that's helping because one kiln is dedicated to one project, another kiln is another project. So then I know if that one's firing, I can go spend some time on this one. So that's helping. Organized woman. No. <laughs> you saw my <laughs> studio. All right. <laughs> well, congratulations. Your work is stunning. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Do Any you, other questions? Sorry. Do, do I recall that you sometimes are also working in Florida as opposed, uh, like you're working backwards and forwards between being very far north and sometimes very far south? Uh, yeah, I yeah. am. You recall that correctly. Um, <laughs> when the economy uh, kind of tanked for all of us and our Canadian dollar was really strong, we bought a house in the Florida Keys. Uh, it's a small house, but we fixed it up over the years. So we try and spend the cold winter months there. Um, my husband's worked outside all his life in the winter, so he quite enjoys being in Florida. Um, so I work down there, but it, it is very much like where I live, other than the climate's beautiful. Um, it's really remote and isolated again. So it's interesting to see the similarities in the two places, even though the vegetation and everything is wildly different, wildly different. Um, it's interesting to live remotely. Anyone have any other questions for Cheryl? The mysteries have all been unveiled. <laughs> we could all go off and do it ourselves, do we think? Not perfect. <laughs> I'll bet it's harder than it looks. It's actually probably it not, but it hard. does. It looks pretty hard. Ellie, what did you, did you want to have a comment? Oh, just that I, I just thought that was such a lovely, intimate presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Heather, go ahead. Okay. And I wanted to just um, back up. And first, I should have said I've loved your work ever since I first saw it. I've never seen it in person, but I just really loved the, especially the white work and the quiet um, presence it has. 
and I'm interested also in your going to Scotland and going to a place where there was a residence that you didn't know, or I guess that's what I sense that it was in a way like going home. And I look forward to seeing how that sense feeds you in the future. Thank you so much. Yeah, I that was a mind-blowing experience. If any of you have any information on genetic memory, uh, please forward it because I'm madly trying to study like crazy um, and figure out if it's a real tangible thing or if it's something in my head. Um, I think science is in the midst of learning about it. So I do have some research on fruit flies and stuff that shows that genetic memory is real. Um, I'm pretty interested in it and pretty interested in the fact that that could be what drives my work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting idea. Um, I, I, I have heard a few other artists also describe that as something they thought was an impulse behind their work. And um, I'd like to know what the science is as well. So when you find out, let me know. Okay. Anyone else? Don't want to miss a comment if somebody is trying to make one. Um, well, thank you very much once again, Cheryl. Most appreciated. Um, and I'm going to just try and, uh, yes, let's just uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, it's always nice to be let into your life in that way. I learned so much. <laughs>